Okay, I'd like to thank also also the three organizers for <coughs> for uh, giving the, me to talk here. Uh, uh, so most of this talk doesn't have uh, uh, much to do with the random matrices, although there will be some connections in the very end, and then there will be another talk by John Keating in the very end where you will hear a little bit more connections to random matrices and and uh, and related things. <coughs> okay, so. Uh, uh, that's the topic, uh, and uh, this is a joint work with these people. So, uh, Julian Barral from Paris, Eero Saxman from Helsinki, and two students, Mika Nikola and Christian Webb from Helsinki. So, uh, what's the topic? So, uh, one way to, say, to tell about the topic is uh, th these are Mandelbrot cascades or, or other kind of uh, <coughs> objects. Uh, they are examples of. Uh, they are, they are, you can view them as random measures on, on say, for instance, Rn, or some subset of that, uh, which have uh, non-trivial multifractal properties. Originally, uh, I think they go back to Kolmogoro, but certainly Mandelbrot was the one who, who uh, sort of brought them more to, as a, <coughs> as a topic, and, and there, the motivation originally was turbulence. So, so in turbulence, you see this multifractal spectra, uh, certain observables in turbulence uh, correlation functions seem to have very complicated scaling whatever uh, different moments of the of the velocity difference in turbulent fluid has has uh, scaling exponents which don't seem to be related to each other and and uh, this was one of the <coughs> motivations for the whole multifractal analysis anyway so these are random measures which has properties so one way to uh, say it is that if you look at uh, uh, take this measure uh, and, and look at uh, the volume, uh, the, the measure of a ball of radius r. These are typically homogeneous measures, so <coughs> translation invariant if I'm on Rn. Look at the uh, mm, volume of a, uh, the measure of the ball of radius r and uh, look at the pth moment of that, then that scales with some non trivial uh, power law with, with the radius. In this case, uh, it's not completely non-trivial, it will be actually a quadratic polynomial, so it will be a sort of simple example of multifractal uh, <coughs> exponent. Okay, so... Uh, uh, there's actually a class of these, and which, which could be, from a mathematical physics point of view, you could view them as Gibbs measures. We'll come back to that in a moment more, why they are Gibbs measures, but but uh, we could write them in the form which would res resemble a Gibbs measure. So <coughs> uh, this would be the following type. You're looking at, let's be, say, for instance, on R for, or, well, Rn if dx is the Lebesgue measure. Uh, and the density is given by exponential. So it's, a, it's some positive density, is something positive. So I write it as an exponential. Uh, and I put there a field, a function, which actually is not a function, it's a distribution. Uh, times a parameter, and let's just think about the parameter as, as inverse temperature, but it's a positive parameter here, actually, even that doesn't make any difference here. Uh, <coughs> so the mm, field here is, uh, is slightly singular, it's, uh, it's a random field, so the randomness lies in the phi, and uh, it's logarithmically correlated. By that, uh, one means that the <coughs> two-point function blows up like a logarithm when you, lo when you look at it at, uh, at coinciding points. So it's a distribution, and, and obviously once you want to take an exponential of that, you have to think a little bit what it means. Uh, <coughs> uh, so so one, one interesting and the most, most uh, important example, but perhaps the most important example is the Gaussian free field, uh, or it's one dimension, uh, restriction to one dimension, which is which is the one uh, <coughs> uh, example of 1 over f so noise. when you say not continuous, you mean not absolutely continuous? Right? It's not uh, absolutely continuous with respect to it. Will, uh, we'll come to that in a moment. <coughs> yes, we'll come to that, yes. <coughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, so you have to regularize it and figure out how, how to get something non-trivial. Okay, we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but before we got come to that, let me just say what, uh, wha uh, what are the interesting properties of the limit. Uh, once, once you succeed constructing them, they have interesting beha behavior as far as uh, uh, this parameter beta here is concerned. So uh, 
beta zero means that you have just a Lebesgue measure, beta infinity is the opposite extreme and between something interesting uh, is happening. Uh, <coughs> uh, so for Barry, absolutely continuous. Just trying to fit everything in one line. <laughs> anyway, so uh, uh, what happens is that in, in high temperatures, a small beta, these measures are are con well here no it's here it shouldn't be absolutely continuous so <laughs> so these are continuous measures uh, 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 but they will be singular with respect the, they are for all beta singular with respect to Lebesgue measure and uh, above the critical points of a large beta they will be actually pure points so they will be actually purely atomic atomic measures and uh, uh, okay so that's what will happen and. And actually, the, uh, if you think about them as disordered systems, they are sort of simple models for uh, something which is called a freezing transition. Uh, transition. Uh, I'll come to that in a, in a moment. Uh, a much more complicated version of which is expected to occur in, in spin glass models. Uh, dimension actually plays very little role here. It's logarithmic correlation, which is the important thing here. So the <laughs> sort of uh, interesting cases which with applications are the two-dimensional where it's a Gaussian free field and the one-dimensional which is the one over F noise. <coughs> okay, uh, uh, not a, okay, so they, they are sort of examples and interesting measures having something to do perhaps with disordered uh, freezing transition in uh, disordered systems and, uh, and perhaps something to do with turbulence. Uh, 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 more recently they were also used as as building blocks in some constructions in random geometry, namely, <coughs> namely when, when one tries to uh, uh, view these measures as, as coming from uh, uh, random Riemannian uh, metrics, uh, one can uh, try to study uh, what sort of uh, what happens when you when you do usual things which you would usually do in Euclidean. Uh, metric, uh, Euclidean uh, me uh, metric, uh, in this random metrics, and uh, uh, for ex for example, looking at dimensions of fractals. So, so there are these relations, which I will come back to later. We we'll go under the KPZ, which ha which is not the KPZ, which was discussed in the morning. So this uh, this line of thinking goes to Duplantier and Sheffield, and also to Benjaminian and Schramm. <coughs> Jurg. I will come to that if you wait five minutes. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I can't say everything at the same time. Let's continue. So uh, uh, one can also they can they they are also uh, can be used to produce curves of the type of SLE on the on the plane. So a construct construction like that going through some complex analysis was done by uh, Astella Jones, Saxman, and myself. Recently, uh, this goes under the name conformal welding, and uh, was also discussed in the case of SLE for, uh, with uh, by Scott Sheffield. All right, so that's an overview of what these things are about. So let's uh, here are a couple of pictures. So if if I'm in the high temperature, that's what this density looks like. This is this is uh, from a recent review by Rods and Vargas, who 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 are who have been. Uh, as, as you will hear, uh, have done interesting work on these measures. And uh, here is, uh, it's barely visible, but uh, once you go above uh, uh, in, in low temperatures, a so large, large beta. So large beta, you typically have just a few spikes, where, whereas in high, high beta, it's very, very <coughs> much spread out. OK, uh, so uh, before I, I define the measures, let, let's first uh, discuss these log logarithmically correlated fields for a second. So uh, let me just define a logarithmic correlated random field, Gaussian random field, uh, by its covariance. So if the covariance is singular like logarithm at, at the diagonal, and then the rest is bounded, let's say continuous. So an, an example, for instance, in R2 would be the, what uh, used to be called the massive free field. Okay? Or you could take uh, the field which we had in the morning uh, you take a domain and take, take inverse of Laplacian on the domain. <coughs> uh, in, uh, if it, uh, in, in one dimension, a similar 
case, which uh, goes under the, under the name 1 over f noise. Uh, here is an example of that. So you, you take uh, independent random variables. You take a random Fourier series, where you take the each coefficient independent normal variable, and uh, then overall, uh, overall 1 over square root of n. So if you compute the variance of that, you see that it blows up like 1 over uh, it's like sum over 1 over n, so it blows up log logarithmically in, the, uh, in this, this uh, <coughs> at diagonal, the field, just like here. Uh, I have a quick question. So yeah. Is it going to matter that you have uh, these are Gaussian processes, or is that not going to matter? It won't play a role, actually, in the, in the discrete case, which is uh, the Mandelbrot cascade. Uh, actually, it works for very general non Gauss, so same thing. You just have to know what the fair correlation is. Uh, important thing is the scale structure. I will come to that in a moment. <coughs> uh, <coughs> okay, so in that, uh, if you compute the covariance of that, it's actually exactly this, this thing here. It's not a di difficult calculation. And here you see that it's just a restriction of the, of the usual Gaussian free field on the circle, if, uh, if, I, if I work on this circle like here. Okay, so these are two interesting examples. One, the third interest, ah, okay, before I go to the third one, uh, <coughs> uh, let me spend a second on that. So all these fields uh, uh, can be decomposed in scales. So if it's logarithmically correlated, it sort of tells you that it's a sum of, if you go in exponential scales, you, have, you should have sort of independent, more or less identically distributed up to scaling uh, contributions. And that indeed is the case, for instance, the examples I showed you. So uh, you can write this field as a sum of infinitely many independent Gaussian fields, which, uh, which you th should think about uh, telling how things are fluctuating on scale, 2 to the minus n, for instance. Any number could be put here. Uh, and, and the covariance there is just uh, uh, something which in, in good cases doesn't even depend on n, but depends a little bit of n depending on the long distance properties. But more or less if, uh, identically distributed modular scaling contributions, which, uh, and this function here is, uh, is smooth and fast decay in, in the distances. So you have this uh, decomposition. Uh, uh, so that gives, me, give, gives one way to regularize also such a field. You say just cut it off at some high scale and you have a smooth field. So I hope so. Well, I don't see height very much longer anymore. It again decays very fast. No, 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 no. GN is, uh, G, uh, GN decays fast in uh, once I'm, I don't have the 2 to the n. If I have 2 to the n, it decays really fast. Let me write you the hierarchical model so you will see. That's the next one. Uh, <coughs> so here's an example of the previous case where I take uh, ultra-local field. So let's take the field. Let's do the following. So take just unit interval. Take, uh, uh, at e take, uh, take uh, dyadic, uh, dyadic inter uh, intervals on the unit interval. So intervals of length 2 to the minus n, which go at, at the dyadic points. Uh, <coughs> and put on each such interval an independent identically distributed random variable. Okay? And write the field as contribution from each scale, namely, at, we have the field at point x, look at the, uh, the dyadic intervals to which x belongs. So at each scale there is only one. Okay? So the field at, at point x has a, has, is given by a sum of uh, uh, <coughs> independent normal variables for, for each interval to which it belongs. So I could write it like I wrote in the previous scale, uh, uh, previous uh, page, uh, as a sum of independent contributions, where this field now is just uh, something which is, uh, which is constant on, the, on that interval and, uh, uh, and zero everywhere else. <coughs> well, if I, if I compute now the two-point function, what is it? Well, it's s uh, <coughs> clearly uh, I take the square of that, uh, and these are independent Gaussians. Only, 
only in the square, the terms where the same Vs occur contribute. So you see that you get uh, so the contribution from uh, uh <coughs> only from those Dirac intervals to which both of the points belong to. So this this, this uh, blows up logarithmi logarithmically in the dyadic uh, 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 distance between the two points. Okay. Here you have exactly the same thing, but you have a translation. Well, you have something which is not exactly constant on the on the scale where uh, the the field uh, the fluctuation field at scale to do the n is not constant, but almost constant. It's a smooth field. Does it answer your question? <laughs> if I put a cutoff n, uh, 2 to the n there, then uh, uh, the variance goes like n, which is logarithm of the cutoff. Okay. Maybe that's the easiest way to see. Okay. Uh, one, another way to write the, uh, the hierarchical field is, is to, uh, because dyadic, dyadic intervals, of course, are other, uh, can be are the same thing as binary trees, right? Uh, so here is a picture. So dyadic intervals I put it down here, and, and the tree is here. So, so uh, <coughs> given any interval, any, any point, it has a unique path on this tree to which, to which it belongs. I put the cutoff here at the, the two, to the mi two to the minus three. Uh <coughs> so so uh, I have uh, a dyadic interval at uh, level n. Uh, little n con consists of just little n uh, symbols, zeros or ones. And, uh, <coughs> and, and uh, that way I can write the field. You can think about it in, an, uh, in another way uh, by thinking that on each edge of the tree, you put a random variable. So I have this tree. At each edge, I put an independent, identically distributed, normal random variable. And then when I'm asking what, does th what value does the field take, for instance, here on this interval. Well, it's constant here and takes the value of this plus that plus that plus that. Okay? So, <coughs> so the field at any point, which I can uh, index by this uh, sigmas, is just sum of ra uh, random weights from, from each uh, uh, edge of the path uh, from the root to the point. So you could think about this field uh, as an energy of a directed polymer on this tree. Okay, and uh, uh, and yet another way to think about it is that what uh, what you are doing is that you are uh, random walking. Okay, so you have a random variable here. So you start from here, you jump by 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 the random variable v, uh, jump somewhere uh, according to that variable. Then you split into two. And, and independently jump here and here and keep on going. So you have a branch, branching random walk. So the value of the field at these points here are just the locations of the branching random walk at time n. Uh, so you think now the scale as time, and there are two to the n particles at, at this position. So there are many ways to think about this, this model. OK, so that being said, now let's take uh, one of these logarithmically correlated fields. And I'm supposed to study this question uh, uh, <coughs> of how to make exponential out of it. So let's take exponential of a logarithmic correlated field, where I cut it off like I, I did it in the previous slide. Uh, <coughs> once you take, for, uh, for instance, the Gaussian free field or, or these uh, similar fields with, uh, in uh <coughs> Uh, translation invariant fields, if I have in Rn, it's usually called uh, mul multiplicative chaos, and uh, also attached to Kahan, who was the first to study it uh, <coughs> uh, in, in more detail. Uh, so uh, take this measure and try to multiply it by some deterministic constant, so that as you take n to infinity, you have a limit. Okay, that's the problem. Uh, multiplicative uh, comes from the from the uh, from the reason that once I write it, this is sum of the scales. Then the exponential of the field is product over the scales, product of independent factors. 
So the density here is a product of independent fact factors. So it's, uh, <coughs> it's a multiplicative version of the usual Wiener case. That, that was the motivation of Kahan. <coughs> uh, maybe even Kolmogorov, I'm not sure. <coughs> OK, so how to do that? Uh, uh, for the hierarchical case, this is actually called Mandelbrot cascade. So, so if I take the hierarchical field, then the measure is called that. And for Tom, uh, there nothing prevents me to take uh, take non each fluctuation can be non-Gaussian. But the important thing is that I have a sum of independent, more or less identically distributed. So fluctuation at each scale can be non-Gaussian, but and uh, th that non-Gaussian Gaussianity doesn't much play much role actually, as long as some moments are. Independence. independence is very important and that then it, uh, the, that's very different from taking a generally non-Gaussian critical model. <coughs> okay, <coughs> so uh, this Mandelbrot cascade also uh, was studied by <coughs> in, a na in, a, in a very important paper by Derrida and Sporn also a long time ago. Uh, so <coughs> if you take that uh, a branching random walk picture or directed polymer picture, then uh, in the directed polymer, exactly what you would be looking, is, uh, looking at is, is, the, is the Gibbs measure, the probability of the path being proportional to, to this energy times, uh, times the temperature factor. Okay. So how would you, how would you uh, uh, and, uh, <coughs> try, to try to study this limit? Uh, the <coughs> there the scale, scale uh, uh, independent scales are important here. Uh, and there is a, uh <coughs> it goes as follows. So uh, I, can, I can sort of think, think about this n here like you're adding randomness. At each new n, you're adding an independent uh, random, uh, random variable, a random field actually. So, you, so your randomness, you can see that it's like uh, you, you can think about the filtration here, so uh, where the cutoff in my problem uh, is, is like time in the usual filtrations, uh, if you think about Brownian motion or something like that. Uh, <coughs> so I have this, uh, uh, this sequence of sigma algebras, and if I split my field, so here's the field with cutoff up to n, so sum of all, all fields up to n, well it's given by the contribution from scale n and the lesser ones. So if I, if I take my, my Gibbs factor and take the conditional expectation fixing the past here, thinking about it as a past, then uh, the future just, the uh, present just comes multiplicatively out because of the exponential function. And, uh, and you get uh, up to constant, you get what you started with. So if you normalize the measure by dividing, dividing by the expected value as Jurg was anticipating, uh, then you have actually a martingale, namely the conditional expectation of the measure with ultraviolet cutoff n is the measure with ultraviolet cutoff n minus one. <coughs> so this is just weak ordering uh, in the language of Gaussian processes. So in particular, if I look at the total mass of the measure, so if I'm, for instance, on the unit interval, let me be on the unit interval for simplicity for the rest of the talk. Uh, <coughs> so if I look at the total mass of the measure, then that, that's a number. Okay, so that's that's a ordinary martingale uh, with expected value one. Because after all, the expected value of my measure is just uh, the Beck measure, and its integral is one. Okay. Okay. So <coughs> this is a, a positive martingale, so it converges almost surely. So I have automatically a limit. Uh, which is non-negative, uh, but of course uh, uh, that's all you get from that. I mean, you don't know whether you get anything non-trivial. And uh, uh, to prove that, uh, uh, once you have such a positive mar martingale, to prove that you get something non-trivial, uh, typically you need uh, a little bit more than integrability. You need a, f a, un a uniform integrability. So, for instance, if if, uh, <coughs> if you can control LP norm for p big, bigger than 1, then you would uh, uh, get a non-trivial limit. Uh, so what Kahan showed is that there is actually, in, in this general setup, there's a, always a critical point. 
such that uh, this martingale is bounded for some p bigger than 1 if and only if you are in the high temperature phase. This is a very easy argument, actually. Uh, in hierarchical model, it's just one. Uh, half of the argument is just one slide. The easier, the easier half of the argument is just. Yes, yeah, so uh, I will give it here. Uh, I will give it here now. <coughs> so if I look at the hierarchical model, what do I have? The total mass of the measure. Remember, it was. Remember this tree structure. If you think about this tree, uh, tree structure, it's obvious what I have here. I'm supposed to integrate the measure over the unit interval is here. Uh, and it had this multiplicative structure, so it was product of these guys. So all of the guys have one common factor here, and then the rest are just copies of the same thing and independent, because everybody was independent. So the hierarchical recursion relation for the total mass is just uh, sum of two identically in distributed independent things as I started with, except that the cutoff is one less, and then the exponential factor. And since I put the weak ordering, there is also the, you have this log, log normal variable here. So if you think about this, this is, uh, what, what is this iteration? I have a random variable, which is uh, average of two identically, more or less identically distributed if, uh, if you think about n stabilizing with n. Uh, so you take average with a random factor, the expected value of this factor is half, because this, this was just chosen so that the expected value of this factor is 1. So I have, I have, I have a random uh, average, uh, <coughs> and I'm supposed to study what happens to this random average as n goes to infinity. Now, uh, it's obvious here that I will get into trouble with, uh, if I look at pth moment of that, because if I have a Gaussian variable and take the pth moment, it grows quadratically in p. And that's uh, the basis of the simple argument, uh, uh, one direction of this, of this argument of, uh, <coughs> of critical temperature, namely, here is my iteration. Just use a simple, simple in, uh, uh, inequality here, where p, p is bigger than 1. I just use the tables p to p is bounded by the sum. Uh, so I get that the pth, pth moment expected value, well, half to power p, that, that's the p squared coming from the average of this guy to power p, and then the rest goes linearly in p. So clearly, whatever beta is, as p is large, I will get into trouble, because this is saying that the expected value of this thing to power p is bigger than something which eventually blows up with p times itself. So you see that th uh, for this to converge, this has to be less than 1. So if, if you translate what I wrote here, uh, beta ha has to be less than something depending on, on p here. So you see that if, if beta is bigger than this square root of 2 log 2, this cannot converge in any LP p, p bigger than 1, just from this, uh, this superadditivity. Converse is two transparencies, so I won't go to that, but it's very similar. And actually, the Gaussian free field goes more or less the same way again because of these covariances, which are more or less, you can approximate it by this hierarchical thing. So, so not only, well, and the critical point will be also explicit. It's just the one given by this simple superadditivity argument. OK, so, so that's what Kahan showed, that it's positive almost surely, the limit. Uh, if beta is less than beta critical, it's almost surely zero for at beta critical and bigger beta. And the same thing for the measures. The measures converge to <coughs> zero in low temperatures and to something which is singular continuous. So continuous measure, but not absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. Uh, the multifractal exponent also is calculable, uh, easily calculable, uh, and, uh <coughs> and and the number is given here. Presumably, you have lot dimensions. Yes, the yes. They can also be computed. <coughs> and I will come to that in a moment <coughs> once we, I discuss the critical point. Is that <coughs> all for hierarchical? No, no. This, is, this was an arbitrary log correlated. Arbitrary Kahan. Uh, arbitrary. So it works for free field ordinary. Yes, yes. It, it's, 
it works for free field in particular. Yeah. I'm sorry? For the hierarchical, it must be an exercise, and for the other, there must be some estimates. Well, the opposite, uh, yeah, 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 it's an exercise. This was an exercise, what I showed you, and the opposite is slightly longer exercise. Maybe for you, it's a fast exercise. <laughs> okay, uh, <coughs> and for Jurg, he was uh, say, uh, referring to old days, so for the old timers, uh, of course, this was studied in the 70s under the name of uh, Liouville model, or or exponential interaction. So if I, <coughs> what am I interested in? I'm interested in this random variable, the integral, integral of this exponential of the field. I'm interested in whether it converges as n goes to infinity. Well, one way to study that would be to study its probability distribution by Laplace transform. So, so look at the expected value of exponential of constant times this random variable and, and try to control that. And that's, of course, a partition function of, of a quantum field theory, uh, uh, namely that E is the free field, and then you have exponential interaction. And what was understood by the constructivists 42 years ago was not all the way to the critical point, but to the L2 critical point, namely to the point where, where the L2 norm blows up. <coughs> so that's BC divided by square root of 2, and now Jörg protested he understood it. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Uh huh. But that was much later. That was later than the chrome, but I mean, they didn't stop this research for the right. Yeah, actually. Does he get up to beta critical? I don't think he got to beta critical, actually. I think he got to beta critical. No, okay. Maybe, maybe. Okay, then that would be interesting because that's. So that's something which was only recently re-understood, let's put it like that. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so let me discuss still the hierarchical a little bit. Uh, so I told you, uh, how, would, how would you get to that? How would you, how would you uh, I will study this Laplace transform. So <coughs> uh, if you look at this, um, uh, this measure, so th this one th for the hierarchical, I told you that it it's, it's the directed polymer. So let, let, let me write it exactly, multiply it by 2 to the n. Uh, so then I have uh, the total mass is just uh, the usual uh, Gibbs sum of, of the energies. So sigmas are the, are, are the 2 to the n endpoints n of, the, of the tree, and I have this energy of the polymer at, at that point. Okay? So it's just what I had before, but there's a 2 to the n and no weak ordering. Uh, then the recursion is doesn't have a half, no, nothing, it's just uh, uh, the same recursion I has had a second ago, except that I have just d to the minus beta v, which is, was the common term for all of them, and then two, two lesser ones. So, <coughs> so look at the Lap Laplace transform of that, in, uh, uh, and uh, it's convenient to look at it in the, uh, not in the usual variable uh, e to the some constant times the random variable, but uh, let's write the was a positive number as an exponential and put even beta there like that. Then what did we show, uh, see from the previous analysis? We saw that uh, this thing multiplied by the 2 to the minus n, which I took away, uh, times the average of the, the weak ordering constant, which goes like e to the minus beta squared times the ultraviolet cutoff. So this is the weak ordered thing, and this converges. So translated into that language, it says that this thing as a function of y, if you shift the y by something linear in n, and think about the n as time in branching random walk, if you shif shift it uh, uh, something linear in time, then it has actually a limit. And this number here is just something comp uh, explicit coming from the 2 to the n and, and the weak ordering constant. Okay, so how would you uh, go into that? Well, uh, <coughs> uh, here, is a, here is again, okay, so here, uh, that's what I'm studying. It has this recursion. Uh, because of the, exp uh, the independence and the exponential function here, this has a very nice iteration. If I look at it at time n plus 1, here is my iteration plugged in. 
this is independent, those are independent, that everybody is independent. So let's take the distribution density of the randomness, Gaussian for instance, and, uh, <coughs> and then uh, everything factorizes. And even, even the randomness goes nicely to this y, so in the end you have this sort of nonlinear convolution relation. So the new guy is that the integral of the square of the old one con convoluted with the Gaussian. And to study continuum limit, the large end limit, uh, is the same thing as to study iteration of such a simple recursion relation. And it has some uh, with initial conditions, namely the in initial condition at minus infinity, obviously uh, uh, you are going to zero, it was as y goes to infinity, and at uh, uh, plus infinity you are, you are going to one. This thing is always between those two. <coughs> okay, so uh, here is again. Uh, if, we, if you look at it, it's clearly that G0 is a linearly stable solution because this is quadratic. G equal 1 is also a solution, but uh, it's linearly unstable solution. So what you expect is that uh, since you were stable at minus infinity and unstable at 1, the 0 should gain, gain ground and you should have something which is moving, interpolating between 0 and 1, moving like a traveling wave, if I think n as a time. And indeed that's what happens. And uh, <coughs> what happens is, uh, is something which also goes back to Kolmogorov, namely this is a discrete version of Kolmogorov KPP equation uh, of, of propagation, of, of, uh, uh <coughs> of nonlinear parabolic equation with a traveling wave behavior. Uh, the, the speed of uh, traveling wave is, depends on the initial condition, beta, and, and that's, that's what will be important here. Okay, so that's, uh <coughs> that's how you would uh, uh, look at that, and that, that's what you can uh, uh, study. So, <coughs> uh, actually the PD was studied by Bramson a long, long time ago, in the 30 years ago, and the discrete version goes very much the same way. Some parts are actually easier, some parts are, well, okay. Uh, anyway, <coughs> so uh, what the result is that uh, you have to go to the moving frame and then you go to a fixed, fixed behavior. If, uh, and there are two imp important th things here what happened. First is that, uh, well, the frame de uh, depends on this cutoff like uh, linearly, uh, as we expected, I saw, showed it to you already in the high temperature. High temperature it was n times uh, some number, c beta here. Uh, but at the critical temperature there is a logarithmic correction and also in the low temperature. And uh, for the no, actually, they didn't uh, write any proof of it. No. Well, we can discuss about it. Uh, <coughs> and uh, mm, what is even more uh, which is also uh, important here is that uh, the limit is independent of beta, actually. This is the speed selection in the PD. Is the, I, there's some, uh, once the decay is fast enough, then you always go to the same same speed, same uh, profile. <coughs> okay, so that's what, what is happening. <coughs> Once you have that, then, then the problem which, which uh, uh, we post is, is now solved because uh, translated back to the original model, we showed that if I translate this Laplace variable by this number here, then we have a limit. So in particular, the partition function multiplied by that variable has a limit in distribution. So if you translate what, what this says at the critical point, there is a correction of square root of n in your normalization, weak ordering constant. So if, if Galavotti actually had this, then it would be, uh, uh, it would be interesting to, to see. <coughs> 
OK, so the marketing angle has to be renormalized by square root of n. Uh, there were similar resu results by Arikon and Shi and Madol also during last, la actually last year. Yeah. <coughs> now, uh, what are the, con the consequences once you have that? Then you can study actually the limiting measures. So what's, what we proved is that the limiting measure is, is still continuous. It's almost surely continuous, but barely so. It has only logarithmic modulus of continuity. And uh, uh, it has Hausdorff dimension zero. So it's very thin, just barely makes it. And uh, consequence of this result that you have this convergence of something independent of beta, this freezing is that the limiting measure is purely atomic if you are in low temperature. That's sort of a nice argument, so let me tell that to you uh, uh <coughs> in a couple of words. So what did the freezing say? It said that if I take my partition function, Multi, uh, uh, well <coughs> the limit thing which, which, which we got, uh, then the Laplace transform written in this funny looking variable is independent of beta. I told you that the limit doesn't depend on beta. This thing here. Once I, you renormalize it like that, you get a random variable whose distribution doesn't depend on beta. So what does this sort of suggest? Uh, <coughs> it suggests that if you look at the, Usual Laplace, uh, Laplace transform, just make a change of variables. It tells you that the Laplace transform of this variable is related to the Laplace transform of the critical variable by funny factor here. How do you get from that function to that function? Well, you just compose this random variable with an extra random variable. Take uh, the Levy process uh, with uh, index which is between 0 and 1, then its, gr its generating function uh, t transforms to t to the power alpha. So I just read this beta critical over beta, and I see that the low temperature is in distribution given by the critical composed with the Levy process. Since everything is sort of uh, uh, scale invariant here, that translates to measures. It was noted by Barrel, Rolls, and Vargas. So not only the total volume of the unit interval, but any sub-interval is actually related to the, uh, as follows. You take the critical measure of that interval and compose it with this Levy process, then you get the low temperature. So the law of the low temperature is completely determined by that. And now, this Levy process where the variable beta critical over beta is less than one, that's a pure jump process. So as a consequence, these measures are purely atomic, whatever you have here. Well, here it's actually continuous, but the result is purely atomic. OK, you can keep on going. So, so then we proved uh, that it's uh, <coughs> uh, zero uh, host of dimension. That's not that important maybe at the moment. <coughs> Uh, so uh, what happens when, once you go to the exponential or free field? Of course, many things become harder, uh, at least uh, when you look at it like this. This renormalization group transformation, which I wrote to you here, this one, where is it? Uh, it's not anymore so simple. So this is a local transformation because of the hierarchical nature of the, of the problem. Uh, there are some dependencies, and that makes things slightly harder. Nevertheless, uh, there are ways to compare the, the non-hierarchical case to the hierarchical case by using, con uh, uh, using <coughs> um, sort of comparison uh, convexity inequalities. And uh, one gets more or less the same results. Namely, when, uh, when you are in the high temperature, that I told you already, uh, that's a classical result. That was apparently also then Galavotti maybe, but certainly by Kahan and these people, <coughs> Bakri and Muzi. Uh, once, you once you take the critical point, then uh, the hierarchical n to half works also here. This was shown by Duplantier, Rhodes, uh, Sheffield, and Vargas just uh, quite recently. and. Uh, and we prove that this thing actually has zero Hausdorff dimension again. Uh, this uh, freezing normalization atomicity uh, uh, actually was posted last week by these people. 
So now there is in the exponential of free field case almost as uh, well, more or less as uh, word by word s the same story as, as in the hierarchical case proven. And the half <coughs> dimension can be computed in the below beta critical as explicitly? In the low temperature. Yes. Uh, uh, high, tem high temperature. High temperature is uh, that's all. That's, that's and easy. And the half dimension can be computed? Yes, it can be computed, yeah. And, uh, <coughs> Right. But this G is not the same as for the hierarchy. No. And uh, this, re uh, this result is, uh, well, this result. Uh, one, one of these logarithmically correlated uh, versions of the free field is exactly scale invariant. I mean, there are many ways to put uh, lo long distance cutoff to the free field, okay, to have that same l short distance behavior. One, one, one is something which is completely scale invariant. and. Uh, that for that particular one, it's, it's as clean as in the hierarchical case. Mm -hmm. That was proven by this bit. OK. <coughs> uh, let me go to a couple. Well, OK, so I didn't uh, discuss really very much uh, uh, how to get into this, and I will not do that. Let me, let me rather tell you a couple of things which, where these measures show up and <coughs> uh, a couple of apl applications. Well, the original application by Duplantier and Sheffield and Benemini and Schramm in the, pure, in the high temperature phase, uh, <coughs> which we, we then expect, uh, uh, extended to the critical case once we understood the critical case, is the following. Uh, <coughs> so this, is, this goes back, of course, to physicists who were studying random surfaces a long time ago in the 80s, Knizhnik, uh, Polyakov, uh, <coughs> and Zamolodzikov. Uh, but the reinterpretation of, that, of, of uh, those things by, by these people was the following. So you look at, look at, we have this random measure. Let's be in one dimension where things are completely uh, clean. Uh, in one dimension, the random measure, of course, uh, defines also a metric because just the measure of the interval is, is a metric. Okay? Uh, so you can use this metric to compute Hausdorff dimensions. So you cover by balls of fixed radius and comp compute how many balls you need, and you look at how that scales. And, uh, and then the KPZ relation is the following. You, you do it with this random metric, you take compact set, uh, compute the Hausdorff dimension with a Euclidean metric and with this guy. And those things are related by a simple formula. So when beta is be beta is less than beta critical, uh, this was the formula uh, uh, proved for this Mandelbrot case by Benjamin and Schramm, and for the two-dimensional free field by Duplantier and Sheffield. And uh, when you go at critical point and, and below uh, beyond, uh, things still make sense, and uh, uh <coughs> this works until the critical point, and after that the Levy process just does a simple rescaling. Okay, so that's the KPZ relation. Uh, another case, and that's actually how I originally ended up to study these measures, is. <coughs> no, no. Uh, let me comment on that, yeah. Maybe here. But before I comment on that, let me comment on the previous slide. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, there's there's a way to produce uh, random curves uh, <coughs> uh, out of uh, well, pr produce curves cur curves from uh, from uh, one-dimensional metrics uh, uh, that goes in, uh, goes under the name of conformal welding. I won't explain that to you. But let me just say that one of the one application of this, this uh, uh, one of f noise measures was exactly that. You get SLE type curves, uh, uh, not in terms of the usual Brownian motion of SLE, but in terms of the, this two dimensional free field, which is the source of the randomness. So you can produce SLE like curves, and the high temperature phase here corresponds to the couple less than four in SLE. Uh, at the critical point here, uh, 
uh, that corresponds to the SLE at, at, uh, at 4 and, uh, and this particular construction we, uh, we haven't been able to do it at the critical point, only in the high temperature phase. Uh, and when you go to the SLE in the, in the region where the curve is not any more simple, then uh, nothing is actually at the moment understood from this point of view. <coughs> uh, as far as your question is concerned, of course in a, a two dimension we didn't have a metric, we had a measure. So exponential, this function times Lebesgue measure was a random measure. And what Duplatty and Sheffield did, that they computed balls, they took uh, balls with this, they pretended that this measure gives, this, uh, use this measure like it was coming from a metric. And you compute balls of, of fixed, uh, fixed radius in that measure. You compute the measure and then define, define the radius that way. But that's of course not the same thing as having, having the Riemannian metric, which would be this object here. And that's certainly not understood at all what sort of object, uh, <coughs> whether uh, once you t take n to infinity, take that such a Riemannian metric, what's the metric space resulting from that? Of course, there are uh, well-defined uh, <coughs> uh, conjectures of what that should be. Uh, namely, one believes, at least in the case when beta is 8 thirds, that uh, you have a four-dimensional space. Uh, the Hausdorff dimension is four, and, and one believes it has something to do with scaling limits of, of critical spin models in random triangulations. I'm sorry? Yeah, so uh, Jean-François Legal has understood this scaling limit from a completely different point of view. So he, it's, it's this one. Space. Yeah, this is the pure gravity case where there is no spin system. Okay, and since it's random matrices, and uh, uh, I should end up with two comments which I heard from uh, uh, Jan Fr uh, Fyodorov, uh, <coughs> which, uh, uh, which are interesting and, and uh, <coughs> worth mentioning. So, uh, one goes, one is the critical band matrices. So, you, t you, take, uh, you take band matrices with uh, independent. Uh, say Hermitian with independent entries which decay uh, like uh, one over, uh, <coughs> uh, like a power law. Uh, and uh, with this particular power law, uh, uh, what you expect is that this, uh, this band mat uh, uh, matrices are neither, neither localized nor extended but critical. And uh, <coughs> so, so there's a parameter B which tells how how strong the off-diagonal elements are. So we are thinking about B small in what follows. Then one computes the, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, eigenstates and, uh, and uh, look at, look, looks at the various L, LQ norms of them, the inverse particip participation rates, and uh, studies how they, be, how they scale with volume. So in this case, one expects them to scale with a non-trivial way not like localized, which would be an, uh, independent of volume, not like extended, which would be sort of uniform, uh, but something in between. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> and uh, there's a nice renormalization group approach to these problems. goes back, back uh, about 15 years ago by, uh, by Levitov, where what he does is he studies, he cuts some, uh, takes the matrix, cuts it off uh, at, uh, at a fixed distance and lets let, let that cut off then vary. And he derives, sees how the eigenfunctions change as you let the cutoff. So you start with n equals zero when you have a pure, uh, completely diagonal matrix and you let it increase up to capital N when you have the original matrix. And you see how that flows. And he, he has an approximate uh, rec uh, recursion relation which looks pretty much like what I was just describing to you. Namely, <coughs> namely the partition, uh, well, once you change this cutoff by one, uh, the result is a linear combination of, of the previous guys, independent and uh, with an independent uh, random variable here between zero and one. I won't write to you the distribution of that. Uh, <coughs> and uh, once you have the explicit distribution of, of this random variable, it's easy to compute then how the, how the expected value of the particip 
participation rate goes. And uh, this was done by Mirlin and Evers slightly after the Levito paper. And they see that it goes like a power law. Depending, uh, power law depends on the LQ, the Q index here. Some comp concrete formula, never mind. I mean, it's just explicit. It's not quadratic like we had in the, in the cascade. It's more complicated. Uh, <coughs> and uh, they also studied the tail of the probability distribution of this, and they concluded that there is a transition at the critical value of the Q, where you, you go the participation rate up to that in the high temperature regime, let's call it like that. Uh, it's given by, by how the expected value scales. And after that, you, you, ha you have sort of shift from the typical to the extreme values. Uh, uh, so uh, Q, Q small, you should think about like the beta small. But for the matrix, it means what? Ah, B. Ah, sorry. So where is it? Uh, so it's here, the off-diagonal elements are small. They are of size B. Diagonal elements are size 1, and off-diagonal elements are size B. What's the value of B? I'm sorry? What's the value of B compared with the size of this, All of this is heuristic, and uh, it's done, well, Levitov is it's heuristic, and it's done uh, perturbatively for small b. Small b, small b yes. OK. This looks very much like the freezing transition, which I was just describing, as was noted by Jan. And uh, I think, uh, well, we think, we still think, yeah. <laughs> that, it should, <laughs> that it should have uh, logarithmic corrections at uh, key uh, Yeah, you can do it in any dimension, actually. But then, then the decay has to depend on the dimension. In three dimension, it goes like three. Okay. Well, Levitov uh, does it, I think, in any dimension. Mirlin do it explicitly in one dimension, yes. <coughs> and Jan has been doing the same thing in a hierarchical model of band matrices. Okay? Uh, so the real, uh, this is probably doable. So there is a logarithmic corrections, and, and one can study the low temperature phase, oh, uh, sorry, large Q phase. <laughs> Uh, of course, the real challenge here would be to justify the realization group. That's, that's, I'm not claiming anything on that, but certainly this, this iteration is intriguingly similar to what we had before. Uh, final example, I should stop, but let me just spell it out. It was spelled out by Jan also when he gave his talk here, but let me spell it out again, because it's also sort of cute. <coughs> and uh, Keating will come back to that in, on Friday. So if you, if you take an n by n unitary matrix, so you take the circular ensemble, uh, look at the characteristic polynomial. Uh, let me put uh, x on 0, 1 to imitate what I had before. Uh, and let's formally just take the logarithm of its absolute value. Uh, uh, it's a periodic function. Expand it. Well, the co uh, uh, trace log uh, is log. Uh, uh, log debt is trace log. So you get sum of traces of u to the power n with the Fourier, com uh, Fourier polynomials here. And uh, what happens is that uh, as, as you take uh, capital N to infinity, and if you fix any finite, the many of these guys, they all converge to, to uh, complex Gaussians, com complex normal variables, so real and imaginary parts, uh, once, you uh, once you scale by square root of n. So formally, your log that logarithm of the, of the of the determinant formally in that limit is just given by my the 1 over f noise which i wrote in the very first transparency so formally formally the absolute value of this in the limit as n goes to infinity converges to something like that so you can ask all the same questions as we asked about about the exp uh, 1 over f noise namely uh, does this limit exist once i take it to power beta uh, uh, does it have a freezing transition? Uh, does it behave? Uh, if you interchange limits, then you have just the exponential of the 1 over f noise, and, and that's the end of the story. But of course, all the problem is in the details. Uh, in, in particular, can you view, uh, view it as a martingale? You can view it as a martingale at fixed x, but uh, I don't think it's possible to do it for jointly in, in x's. So this is considerably harder than 
than the exponential of the free field case. <coughs> and it has nice applications, as you will hear on Friday. So let me stop. Thanks a lot.